All right, so good morning and thanks for coming. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our second safety webinar. And today's topic is gonna to be on slips, trips, and falls. All right, so we're gonna discuss the OSHA standards, um, some statistics, types of falls, causes of falls, uh, prevention methods and me measures, getting on and off equipment, loading dock safety, and who is responsible for safety that surrounds slips, trips, and falls. All right, so the OSHA standard that uh, governs slips, trips, and falls is 29 CFR 1910 subpart D walking working surfaces. This rule was revised on, it was around January 2017, and they didn't throw out the old rule completely. They updated a lot of things that needed to be updated. So some of the key uh, updates were employers must identify and evaluate slip hazards, trip hazards, and falls in the workplace. Uh, this assessment requires the employer to verify that this was performed through a written, written certification which identifies the workplace evaluated, the person certifying that the evaluation was performed, and the dates of the hazard assessment. A couple other updates are that employer um, it is to provide appropriate personal protective equipment or fall protection systems um, to address the slip, trip, and fall hazard identified in the required hazard assessment. Also, um, employers are to conduct, conduct regular inspections and maintenance of all walking and work services in the workplace. They are also to provide training that enables employees to recognize the hazards of falls and the procedures to be followed to minimize these hazards, including the use of uh, personal fall protection, proper ladder, climbing techniques, um, you know, the type of shoes they're supposed to be wearing, how they're supposed to be cleaning things up. So all these things were the biggest updates to the OSHA standard. All right, so some st statistics for falls. OSHA estimates that slips, trips, and falls cause approximately 15% of accidental deaths. It's second only to motor vehicle accidents. So they also account for between 12 to 15% of work compensate, work, workers' compensation costs. And one of the most frequently reported injuries, and that's about 25% of the reported claims per year are from slips, trips, and falls. And the average cost for one disabling injury is now getting upwards around $38,000. And over 70% of all disabling occupational injuries result from falls. So I ask, who's at risk? Everyone is at risk, no matter your industry, gender, age or job, it doesn't matter if you're in a high hazard job or if you're a clerical worker, there is a risk for a slip, a slip trip or a fall. Falls are the leading cause of non-fatal injuries for people ages 25 and over, and they account for more than 26% of injury-related visits to the ER. So some of the most frequent factors in slip trips and fall accidents are found below. 16% are housekeeping issues, 25% of the incidents are wet or slippery surfaces, and then if you see the big number, 54% are human factors. So we're going to talk about all of these things. So first, the types of falls. Same level fall. These are high frequency, low severity. Um, it's when you um, slip or trip on a walking or working surface and falls on the same level are approximately 60% of all compensable fall cases. Then we have elevated falls, which are, they're low frequency, but when they happen, the injuries are gonna be more significant. <clears throat> Half of all accidental in-home deaths are caused by a fall. Most fall injuries at home happen at ground level. I thought that was interesting to throw out there. And something I, I didn't mention was that more than 60% of elevated falls are from less than 10 feet. So we all, we think about the high rise construction, guys up five stories working, um, but most of the falls from elevated surfaces are 10 feet or less. So we're talking, you know, lots of step ladders, 
things being used for ladders that aren't supposed to be used, but I think that's a pretty interesting statistic. All right, so slips. A slip is a loss of balance caused by too little friction between a person's foot and a walking surface. Some of the common causes are walking from one surface onto another, wet or oily surfaces, sloped surfaces, occasional spills, weather hazards, loose unanchored rugs or mats, and flooring or other walking surfaces that are worn, and improper footwear. Slips, um, something we talk about with slips is the coefficient of friction. So this is the ratio between the force necessary to move one surface horizontally over another and the pressure between the two surfaces. And there's a lot of math that can go, in, that can go into this, but I've got a couple good examples to kind of describe the coefficient of friction. So um, it is important to achieve a high coefficient of friction between the soles of your feet and the surface you're walking on to prevent a slip. So the coefficient of fric friction can be as low as 0.1 when you're wearing non-slip shoes on ice, oily, and wet surfaces. A, a work boot um, that's when you're walking on brush, a brushed concrete surface, it can have a coefficient, a coefficient of friction as high as 1.0. So think about something you know very slick with non-slip shoes, and then think about a work boot on some um, rough, roughed up concrete. Leather-soled shoes can achieve a number as low as 0.10 when they're worn on a smooth, wet surface as well. So a trip. A trip occurs when your foot or lower leg hits an object and your upper body continues moving, throwing you off balance, or it's when you step down to a lower surface and you lose your balance. So some of the common causes for a trip are your, your view is obstructed, poor lighting, there's clutter in the way, wrinkle carpeting, uncovered cables, and drawers not being closed. Also, uneven uh, walking surfaces. Something that I'm always looking for and it happens around my house is you, you go from one level to the next and it, you might not even notice it, but your toe will get caught on that you know, raised up concrete that you just didn't see, you didn't know was there. So those, you know, even though it's not a big gap, just an inch of a surface going from one to another that can cause somebody to trip pretty easily. So we're going to talk next about the six steps to prevent slips, trips, and falls. So the first is create good housekeeping practices. We want to reduce wet or slippery surfaces, avoid creating obstacles in aisles and walkways, create and maintain proper lighting, wear the proper shoes, and then we're going to talk about individual behavior. So these are a couple pictures just to reference what we're looking for. This is obviously cables in the way. It looks like a walkway or possibly um, someone's cubicle where they're working. This is a really dimly lit entryway and you can see the file cabinets, the sign. Um, this is considered blocked egress. So if there were to be an emergency, um, it would be hard for a large number of people to exit the building from this um, access point, but it's also there's hazards in the way because of the the improper lighting. You might leave a fire file drawer open and trip over it. Thought this was a funny picture of an improper ladder use. Uh, everybody finds these pictures pretty funny, but you've got the two guys at the bottom holding up the ladder. And this is one of my favorites. We have a pretty large step ladder, very tall ceiling, and um, our friend here has his ladder up on. Home Depot buckets to get him that extra little bit of um, reach. And you can also see he's standing on the, the top step of the ladder, which is a definite no-no. So create good housekeeping practices. It's critical, this, this is critical to maintain a safe environment. Um, safety and housekeeping, they go hand in hand. You can't have a good safety program or a good safety environment without good housekeeping. Uh, poor housekeeping leads to an environment of risk acceptance. So if everybody is used to working in a cluttered, dirty area, they just, they just begin to accept it and it's very hard to get them to just start having good housekeeping habits. And housekeeping is a routine. It should be ongoing and part of a worker's daily report performance. So you know, when somebody has to stop 
the process of what they're doing 15 minutes early to clean up their workspace, I think that's definitely appropriate because you don't want somebody coming in on the next shift and having to work in a mess, or you don't want that same worker coming back the next day when he's fresh and have to spend you know, a portion of his morning cleaning up from what was done yesterday. So there's three, three steps to creating an effective housekeeping program. Plan ahead, know what needs to be done, who's going to do it, and what the area, the work area should look like when you're done. Assign responsibility. There may be certain responsibilities assigned to specific individuals, um, but everyone should be responsible for cleaning up, to, up after themselves. Implement a program. So integrate housekeeping duties as part of a worker's daily tasks, or you can have a standalone housekeeping program. If you're working with um, anything that's creating silica dust, there's certain things that you have to do to, for housekeeping. You can no longer just sweep that dust up with a, uh, with, a, with a broom because you're recreating that hazard. So depending on the industry you're in, it's a good idea to have a housekeeping program that identifies how you're supposed to be cleaning up um, and who's supposed to be cleaning up. All right, number two, we're gonna talk about reduce wet or slippery surfaces. Uh, the most frequent surfaces for rep reported injuries are parking lots, sidewalks, food prep air areas, and areas where liquids and greasy substances are used. So parking lots, um, if it's not your parking lot, you need to train your employees when they're entering parking lots to be aware and to be looking ahead at where they're going, especially in bad weather. Sidewalks, side, whether it's your sidewalk or it's a vendor's sidewalk, you need to make sure that you're looking ahead and you're not on your phone trying to get the meeting details as you're walking into the building. So be aware of sidewalks. Food prep areas, things that are slick. Um, if you're not wearing the proper soles in these you know, in a restaurant, then um, you, the chances of falling, slipping, or tripping are going to be increased dramatically. Any type, anytime you're using any type of solvents, liquids, um, greases, those things are going to be spilled on the floor. You need to be able to, you need to keep those um, liquids contained, and you need to be aware when you're in these areas. So indoor control measures, use absorbent mats with beveled edges, um, ensure the mats have a backing that will prevent it from sliding. So entryways, exits, you want to have these type of mats. Use anti-skid tape in troublesome areas. If there are areas that are known to be slick, not even because of a substance on the floor, put down some anti-skid tape. Clean up spills immediately um, and ensure there are spill, ki spill kits available. Also, if you're mopping floors or if there has been a spill and you do, you know, it's a good idea if you have customers entering that area to use a wet floor sign. The biggest issue with using wet floor signs for employees is that once they go out, a lot of times when the floor is dry or it's cleaned up, the wet floor signs don't get removed. So when an employee, when that happens, an employee sees that sign, they stop paying attention to it. So if you are using wet floor signs, um, for your employees in your work areas, make sure they're being removed when the floor is dry. You don't want employees to just see those all the time and not pay them any attention. All right, so number three, avoid creating obstacles in aisles and walkways. So injuries can be caused by hallways used for storage, like in the first picture that we showed, equipment that's out of place and materials that might be left behind. High traffic areas should be inspected regularly. Avoid using extension cords, hoses, and cables in designated walkways. Um, sometimes you have to use those, and if you do, you want to use a floor cord cover. Duct tape is always an option to use, but this is something that is very, very temporary, and after a couple people walk over it, it starts to peel up, and you can create a bigger hazard than what you had uh, with just the cords laying across the ground. So try to use floor, um, floor cord covers. Avoid stacking paper, paper boxes in alleyways. Um, you want to try to find other storage areas that are not uh, used for walkways. And ensure that file drawers and cabinets are not, uh, not left open. All right, the, number four, create and maintain suitable lighting. <clears throat> so poor lighting is definitely associated with an increase in incidents. Hallways, staircases, ramps, and ba basements. Um, 
that may not, you may not consider them essential walkthroughs or people use them, but these areas do need proper illumination unless they're completely sealed off for anybody to travel through. Um, keep the areas around light switches clear of any obstructions. And you also want, want to make sure that switches, breakers, cords, and fixtures that go out or break or malfunction are paired immediately so that you can have light in those areas. All right, number five is wear proper shoes. Ensure employees are wearing the appropriate footwear for the job that they're doing. It might be steel toe, uh, boots, non-slip shoes, um, non-conductive electrical footwear, uh, metatarsal boots. Um, so if you are requiring your employees to wear a specific type of shoe, make sure that they're wearing it. Shoelaces always need to be tied. This is something that I see a lot on construction sites. I will notice that boots are untied or they're laced real loosely with knots on the end. Um, this is not good to try to prevent slips, trips, and falls. You wanna make sure shoelaces are tied. If a slip, trip, or fall occurs, um, the employee's shoe should be evaluated during the investigation. So was the shoe, did the shoe have anything to do with the slip or fall? Um, if so, you need to evaluate either what everybody's wearing or just that employee. Individual behavior. So we cannot control an individual an individual's behavior, but we can continue to teach, train, and instill safe work habits on a regular basis. So some behaviors that cause slips, trips, and falls, carrying or moving cumbersome objects or moving too many objects at a time, not paying attention, taking shortcuts, not using the designated hallways, being in a hurry and rushing, that one is huge. And that's how a lot of incidents um, and injuries happen is you're in a hurry, uh, you're rushing to try to get done, or even fatigue as well kind of goes into that. Not observing posted signage. Make sure that your employees that are, might be working offsite are paying attention to the signage in other, building, in other buildings or other work sites. Entering unauthorized or restricted areas. And then the last, probably what comes up on everybody's mind is cell phones. Um, walking around with your cell phone, looking at it, not looking up, uh, that is a big distraction for everybody, not just your people that are working. Um, that, you know, we're not gonna talk about cell phones and cars right now, but cell phones are a huge distraction and you wanna make sure that when your employees are walking from one area to another, that they're not looking on their phone the whole time just because they have that, might have a couple extra minutes in between whatever tasks they're doing. All right, so going beyond controlling behavior. Uh, very few people actually believe that walking poses a risk or injury, probably because the average person um, safely takes over 5,000 steps a day. So what you really want to do is to change your employees' risk perception. You can show them videos on the impacts of slips, trips, and falls. When you have a toolbox talk, you can discuss um, your own or their personal experience from having a fall or when they started slipping. And just that conversation to the group um, could be helpful in a certain area or during a certain time. Also, you want to make it personal. You want to help employees understand the impact a fall can have on their work performance, their family life, their hobbies. You know, you might think that if you fall and it, nothing's going to happen, but you might have a severe injury where it's really going to affect picking up your kids at home. Or if you're a hunter, it's going to affect how, you know, if you're able to hunt. So all these things need to be uh, brought up with your employees so that they can understand that if you're injured at work, it's not going to only affect your work life and your work performance. It's going to affect your personal life as well. All right, so a couple things on falls from equipment. Extra riders from tractors, um, equipment, or the bed of a truck can lead to a death or serious injury. The safest way to operate is to not have riders. Uh, if the operation requires riders, they must have seats or a protected work area. If you have a forklift with one seat, that means one, ride, one driver, no riders. If you have a forklift with four seats, that means four riders can be on that forklift. So many injuries can occur due to slippery metal steps. You wanna make sure those are dry, especially in the winter time when those things become icy. Your employees need to take an extra step to either scrape the ice off or to go a little slower so they're not slipping on that. 
grip handles tightly with both hands before you step up and you always want to use three points of contact. So falling falls from loading docks. Metal dock plates can definitely be slippery. If they are worn, they can have bent corners or edges that can cause trips. Um, diamond plate metal is still definitely slippery when it's wet and it's really slippery if you get some sort of greasy substance on it. And missteps can result in falling off the dock if not properly guarded or barricaded. So you wanna make sure that your docks are properly illuminated. At a minimum, you need to have double chains installed to prevent falls when, it, when dock doors are open. Anytime you have that dock door open, it needs to be protected from falls. Especially we're getting into the summer months, it's gonna be hot. Uh, you're going to be letting air into your buildings. You need to make sure that those dock openings are secured. Um, slip resistant materials should be used where foot travel occurs near docks edges. So if that's possible to put down some slip material, even um, highly visible tape to make sure that people know that they're getting to an area where they could fall off, I think that's a very good idea. All right, so who is, we asked this before, but who's responsible for preventing slips from some falls? It's everyone. So safety responsibilities should not be left to one person. Um, and effective safe, safety cultures include management, supervisors, laborers, the entire company, your office workers. So it, it should include everybody. If you have safety meetings, you should include your office personnel as well as your cleaning personnel. So you, it's everybody's responsibility, and but nobody wants to go around and be the single safety police and have to remind, you know, remind the same people every day about what they're doing wrong. So you want to coach them and you want to support them, but we're going to talk a little bit about who's responsible for safety. So the company's responsibility, you're, you're responsible to provide training, maintain, um, probably maintain work sites, develop policies and procedures, invest in quality housekeeping products, develop and maintain a safe working culture, provide regular reminders on safe working habits and support employees when an issue does arise. The employee's um, responsibility is to actively participate in training, report maintenance issues, follow policies and procedures, follow housekeeping requirements. They're responsible to be a positive contributor in a safety culture, um, analyze and improve working hab or walking habits and you don't want to allow your employees to become complacent when they get home. So everything they're doing at work, um, following safe guidelines, just for the walking, working, falls, slips, trips, hazards, they should be doing the same things at home and you should encourage them to do those things at home as well. All right, so just to wrap this up, everyone is constantly exposed to slips, trips, and falls. If you're solely focusing on hazards and the physical aspects, aspects of slips, trips, and falls, then you're only dealing with half the problem. So a lot of this is mental with your employees. The risk perception and behaviors contribute to at least half of this issue. And if human factors are not addressed, uh, I'm, I've, I've left the line out there, but if they're not addressed and constantly brought up, then your employees don't, they're not keeping that in the front of their mind. No one chooses to slip or fall, but regular reminders about hazards and safe work habits will keep safety on their minds. And train employees to clean up spills, uh, pick up debris, and keep high traffic areas clear whenever they discover that there's a problem. Um, you want your employees not to walk by it and leave it for the next person to get injured. You want them to have in their mind, there's something that could hurt somebody, let's pick it up, let's clean it up, and not leave it for the person that might, might not be paying attention the next time. So that's gonna conclude our presentation for today. I'm Michael Williams and this is my contact information. So I'm gonna unmute everybody and if we have any questions, um, we can open it up for, for questions. So do, do we have anything out there today? I think that was um, Benin's music playing in the background. Is that Mozart? <laughs> I don't know what that was. Well, good job as usual, though, on the uh, presentation. Well, thank you. Um, you got, got anything out there from anybody? Questions or comments?
Okay, well, I appreciate everybody being here today. And if you guys are interested in having this presentation, we're recording it, uh, get in contact with either myself or your uh, producer, and we can have this sent out to you and any other type of uh, slips, trips, and falls safety resources that you may need. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Michael. Take care, buddy.